Hi, folks. We're here. Finally, proofs. Um, normally, in a regular semester, this takes like a, about a month before we get there, but we're flying through this material. So let's take a look at some of the stuff that we're going to be doing today. Um, we're going to get into the, some of the terminology, kind of the procedure of what's involved in a proof. Um, direct proofs is a type of proof, indirect proofs. We'll look at a proof by contraposition. We'll look at vacuous and trivial proofs, proof by contradiction, and proof by counterexample. And hopefully, we'll get through all of that today. We're cramming in two lectures into one, so hopefully we'll get it. All right, so let's first kind of go back to what we were doing the other day where we were just using our rules of inference, and we did the example, I believe we did the lion one, we did the thing with um, Marla being a student and all that. You guys remember that? So here's one that's similar. We're going to um, show that uh, the following premise is a student in this class has not read the book, number one, and everyone in this class... Uh, has passed the, the exam, does that, do those two things imply that someone who has passed the exam has not read the book? Sounds right, right? Let's look at it, let's walk through that basic, the basic idea. So what are our propositions and our predicates? What can you think of here? What do we need to set as variables? Yeah, yeah so that's our domain, maybe, yeah, is, is students in the class. Okay, what else? X has read the book, right? Okay. What else? X passed the first exam. Okay, X passed the first exam. Good. So let's see if X B X is in this class, right? And that's so it looks like our domain is going to be all students, right? Uh, let B of X B X has read the book, and then P of X is that X passed the first exam. I think that's enough to get us going. What do you guys think? Yeah? Yeah. All right. So what's our argument going to look like? Remember, the argument takes the form of premise, premise, conclusion, right? So, or maybe two or three premises, maybe one, maybe just two, maybe four, or whatever. What premises and what conclusion can we see in formula equation form? I got to tell you, it's killing me to sit here right now <laughs> instead of being on the whiteboard. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, what do you guys think? Uh huh. Uh, Quantifier? Yeah, that, there yep, you go. Yep, yep. I was reading that your mind. See? Someone, the, not, that, not the everyone one, but the. Yeah, there the exists. Yeah, there, there exists. Yeah. That is the. Somebody say it. What's it called? Existential, Existential yeah. quantifier. Good. There exists someone. Yes. So how, let's, how would that look? You're, you're exactly right. What's that formula going to look like? Existential sign, then what? So look at that final sentence. Someone who passed the first exam has not read the book. So that means there exists some student who is um, who has read the book. Uh, sorry, who has not read the book, so not B of X, and passed the first exam, right? P of X. So here's our premises. We have one premise that says there exists somebody that's in this class, and that student has not read the book. That's our premise number one. You guys agree with that formula? Mm -hmm. Okay. With that in mind, what's premise number two look like? Everyone in this class has passed the first exam. What's the other? What's it called? What? Universal, universal quantifier. Yep. Of X. So universal quantifier X. Yep. And then what's in our parentheses there? It's, it's E of X then P of X. Okay. So um, everyone in this class has passed the first exam. So. So. Uh, we could say um, for all x, c of x is in this class, and p of x that they've passed the, the they've passed it right. But you you also said if right. So in this case, uh, this this makes more sense. If you're in the class, therefore you've passed the exam. Yeah. So this is our, our conditional and our conclusion. What's that going to look like? Existential quantifier of x. Okay. Somebody besides Chad? I appreciate the enthusiasm, but I want to give everybody a chance. Anybody else? So somebody passed the test, so P of X and not B of X. Yeah. There you go. So that's our argument. So this is the way proofs 
happen. Now, when we get into depth and proofs today, we're, we have to figure out how to get to the formula. And um, I've heard that in philosophy class, I've never taken a philosophy class, but I've heard that um, they often will give you as an assignment to take some uh, work from some philosopher and convert um, a page or a sentence or a paragraph into an equation. So it, when you convert it into an equation, um, like a whole, um, the whole entire paragraph into an equation, that's a crazy thing to do. But when you're dealing with the proof, that's kind of what you have to do. It's a good practice to do that kind of thing. So this is what we have to do. We have to figure this out. We have to figure out what our statements are, what our prepositions are, propositions are, what our predicates are, what our argument is, which will include all the premises and our conclusion. And then hopefully we get to, there we go. So now we need to work our way down from those premises. We're basically trying to say that if this is true and this is true, that implies this is true, right? This and this, therefore, the, the conclusion. Make sense? Okay. So let's take a look here. This is our premise. What can we do by looking at that? What can you see that can be done to this? Well, I think you're barking up the right tree. You guys know what he's talking about? Assuming you're talking about the thing I think you're talking about. I don't want to say it. Give everybody else a shot. Yeah, it is existential something. There you go. Existential instantiation. Okay? So we are going from a quantified statement to a specific statement. Let's remember what that means. We're saying that there exists at least one student such that, or at least one x in the domain, which is all students, such that that student is c of x, which was in this class, and they have not read the book, that that person exists. I'm claiming that that person is A, right? Maybe it's Beavis, maybe it's Bob, whoever, whoever, right? But it's c of A, that's the person. Okay, so existential instantiation. Now what can we do? Remember, here's our ultimate goal. We're looking to somehow manipulate these two first premises equations. We're trying to manipulate them mathematically to look something like that. That's what our goal is. We're trying to manipulate them to look like that. All right? So any thoughts on what we could do? R rules of inference. Yeah, we could use rules of inference or logical equivalences or something like that. So let's take a look at the next one that, might, that we, we, we could use. Simplification. Remember that rule? Okay, the simplification. Um, this is the, the idea that if C, if P is true and Q is true, then we know that P is true, right? So we know that C of A is true. Would you guys agree with that? Okay. I think at this point we've kind of reduced the first premise down to as much as we can. For now, we may come back. And when you're doing a proof, there's a lot of trial and error, right? Maybe that wasn't the rule of inference we needed. Maybe we just got lucky and that's the first one we tried. Maybe not, right? So you got to kind of play around a little bit, which is exactly what I had to do with the hummingbird proof, man. That proof was crazy to come up with the right answer. Okay, so and we'll, we'll look at that today if we have time. So next up, let's take premise number two. All right, what can we do with that? Yeah, we need to instantiate. So universal instantiation. And I'm going to claim, so if, if this is true, and we know these are all true, right? Those premises are true. We know them to be true, right? Because the whole point of a proof is that something occurred, therefore this other thing will occur, right? Well, what's the something that occurred? Premise one and two. Therefore, the other thing that should occur is our conclusion. So we know that number four is true. Therefore, if it is true for all, it is definitely true for one. So if it's true for one, let's make it true for that same guy that we used in number two, A or Bob or Beavis, whoever that was, right? All right, groovy. Now what? Two and four? Yeah. So like well, we're, we're, we've, we've simplified four into what five is now, right? So we know it's C of A, and then C of A, therefore P of A, then can we conclude that we have P of A? Um, so, like that? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 
and I, I've got it on the screen. I meant, to, I meant to ask you guys what it's called beforehand. But yeah, modus ponens, exactly right, yeah. So when you have a conditional statement, and then you know that the right side of the conditional is true um, also, uh, I'm sorry, if you know that the left side is true and you have a conditional, then you know by modus ponens that the right side is also true. So we use modus ponens for number three and number five, right? Make sense? Okay. So now we've got this narrowed down. We've basically reduced premise one to this, and we've reduced premise two to that. Now, what are we trying to do? We're trying to find something that looks like this. Well, we're partly there, right? We have a P of A there, don't we? Yeah? Okay, what else can we do? We need to somehow get that B of X. Very good, yeah. We can simplify number two as well. We already simplified number two, right? We took this, and using our um, rules of inference, we came to this conclusion. But we could just as easily have taken that and came to this conclusion right here. Agreed? Okay. And there we go, simplification for number two. Now, what do we have? We have P of A. We also have B of A, not B of A, I should say. Well, if you have one and you have the other and they're both true, what do we also know? Uh, that's the last step. There's one step in between. You're right, but that, we're going to do that in a second. But because I have six to be true and seven to be true, what can I do? I can, I have, therefore, P of A and not B of A is true, which is exactly what I'm looking for right here, right? P of something and not B of something, right? And I have, there's the P and there's the not B, right? So that is conjunction. That's the rule of inference called conjunction. And now we do uh, yeah, um, existential generalization. If it's true for A, then it's true for at least one. Agreed? It's true for A, well, then there exists somebody, and that somebody happens to be A, and there we go. So through this process, the hummingbird proof we'll do later today, hopefully, is about 20 steps, right? Um, through this process, we were able to manipulate math. I mean, we're just basically, it's kind of like doing algebra, right, where you just solve for X or something like that. You're just rearranging the equation to get it to look the way you want. I know that this is, these two things are true. That is not questioned. We know that. How we know it is irrelevant at the moment, but we somehow know that that's true. Then, then therefore, that we're trying to find that by manipulating those two to make that. All right? Questions about that? Oh, <laughs> nice. I drew that on my slide. Okay. All right, any questions about that? Feeling okay? All right, so let's look at this idea of universal modus ponens. Um, this should be pretty intuitive. We may or may not get to actually a practical application of this, but uh, this is another rule of inference. Take a look at what I have there. Does everybody agree with what I've concluded? I have two premises, right? I have premise number one, and I have premise number two. Now, how can I even have premise number two? What would we have done to be able to get premise number two? Yeah, if we instantiated uh, universal instantiation there, we'd have P of A there for Q of A. Okay, so if we know that P of A is true, then what we basically have is P of A, therefore Q of A, and we have P of A. Well, what is that? It's modus ponens, which means Q of A is true, right? That's the same idea, okay? So this can come in handy when you're dealing with quantifiers. Uh, we may not get to using that today, but I just want to kind of show it to you so you're familiar with it. So here it is, guys. This is the stuff we've been waiting for. This is the stuff that we build up to. We learn about... Um, truth tables, bless you, propositional logic, um, how to use logical equivalences, rules of inference, all these things com come together, and that little proof we just did a minute ago with uh, the students taking the test and everything, that was just a little review of last, last week's stuff, but uh, we now have all the basic tools we need to actually start doing proofs, so let's make sure we understand some of the terminology here, and so let me just show you a couple here, first one, theorem, Proposition, bless you, and a lemma. Okay? Those three things are basically true-false statements. Okay? Now, 
this is your first dive into the world of discrete math where you'll start seeing that not everybody agrees on definitions, okay? In some situations, it is, and the book follows this line of thinking too, that a theorem is a known truth. It is true. A theorem cannot be false. In other places, I've heard people refer to, here's the theorem we're trying to prove, and it may or may not be true, right? And you can kind of see that here. It almost seems like a little bit of a contradiction. Look at proposition. What do we know from day one about a proposition? What is a proposition? Ignore what's on the screen for a minute. What's a proposition? Yeah, but it can have a true or false value, right? Remember my claim that St. George was the capital of Utah? That was a proposition with a false truth value, right? Well, here, the definition of theorem says that it's a statement that can be shown to be true. Notice it doesn't say that can be shown to be true or false. The theorem is true, okay? Well, it says a proposition is a less important theorem, but propositions can be false. So you get into this little weird sort of play with words. Um, if you get asked these questions on your homework, use these definitions, which are right in the book on the first page of chapter 1.7. These will be the answers that I will expect from you. But just know you may hear different terms for a theorem. You, you may hear people say things like it's an unsolved theorem or an unproved theorem. One group of people says that's impossible. If it's a theorem, it's been proven. Other groups say that it's not. So just know that. A lemma is just, it's the same thing as a theorem. It's exactly the same thing. It's just that it's not, not as, um, they use the word important, but it's not as like a critical, it's not as big of a deal. It's just a smaller, less important theorem. And as you're doing proofs along the way, you may use other theorems that have been proven. You may use other lemmas that have been proven, right? You may use propositions, okay? So questions about those three, right? Let's take a look here then. We know, uh, let's, since we mentioned the word proof, this is the whole thing we're going to be getting to today. It's a valid argument that, establish, that establishes the truth of, of the theorem, okay? So you have a theorem, and you need to show that it's true. How do you show that it's true? Kind of like what we've been doing before. We had a theorem that said um, if somebody took the test and passed it, and if everybody took the test and passed it, and if there's somebody who hasn't read the book, therefore, there's somebody in the class that passed that didn't read the book. That's our theorem. That's what we're trying to prove. Okay? And we walked through a proof. We made an argument. Remember argument? Premise one, premise two, conclusion. That's an argument. So we made that. Okay. Questions about that one? Axioms. Axioms are statements that are known to be true, and we just don't argue with them. Right? They are just givens. They're obvious. When you look at them, we, we, they're just mathematical certainties that are just known, and we don't argue with them. And in fact, if you look in the back of the textbook, there's a whole appendix about a whole bunch of mathematical axioms. And when you read them, they'll, they'll make sense. There's one that you see used in uh, um, geometry, which um, states that um, if there exists a point A and a point B, then some line exists that crosses both point A and point B, right? That's just a kind of a duh, no-brainer kind of a thing, right? That's what axioms are. All right, corollaries. So the corollary here, and these kind of go hand in hand, the conjecture, well, we'll start there. Um, you can, if you have a theorem that's been proved, and again, you see this here, this, this wording, a theorem that can be established directly from a theorem that has been proved. That seems counterintuitive to the idea that a theorem is always true, right? You see how the words kind of seem contradictory, where there's this school of thought that says the theorem is always true, but yet this cor corollary thing is saying it's based on a theorem that has been proven true, which implies that there could be a theorem that has not been proven true, right? So it's a little weird wording, right? Anyway, you look at a theorem, and it's been proven, and you're like, oh, well, if that's true, well, then this is probably true. That's a corollary, right? It's as simple as that. Next up, um, a very common one, which gets proof started um, a lot of times where somebody has sort of that lightning bulb moment, that brainstorm, that epiphany, where they make a statement that they're proposing to be true based on anecdotal evidence, based on experience, based on um, you know different things that they've seen in their life. They're like, man, I've seen this and this, and I wonder if this whole thing would be true. 
right? It's just sort of observational ideas that that's a conjecture. Um, and look at the last line there. Many times conjectures are shown to be false, so they are not theorems, right? <laughs> There's that weird thing. If it's false, it's not a theorem, okay? So these words are a little tricky, and it takes some time to study them and to understand them. Um, but again, if you get asked this on a homework assignment, these are the answers I'm looking for, okay? I want to make sure you understand those, all right? So questions about the basic terminology. You'll hear me mostly use um, axiom, theorem, proposition. Those are the main ones we'll be using in the, in the course, okay? All right. All right, so here we go. This is the, proce the process that we do to write a proof, all right? Um, they will use axioms. They may use axioms. They will use definitions, right? We know that like, we're going to learn today, uh, we're going to do some proofs dealing with odd and even numbers. And so there are definitions that say this is the definition of an odd number. We have to, in our proof, state that by this definition of an odd number, therefore this, 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 and this, okay? So choose a proof method. Typically, the proof method you will do is what's called a direct proof, which we'll see in a moment. You will use your axioms, and you will mention which axioms you are using. You will use the definition of whatever terms you're going to be using. You can use previously proved results, like other theorems, lemmas, and so forth. And you can use rules of inferences, logical equivalences, and so on and so forth. Remember, all theorems must make sure that all the axioms used are proven facts. And using that word proven there is a little bit of a, a tricky word because axioms, they're more like known facts or just, we, there's not really a proof for them. They're just things that are obvious to us, okay? But make sure that the axioms are real, that they're not, you're not just making up something and claiming it's an axiom, right? That's the idea there, okay? All right. Slide work. What's going on? There we go. So we've talked about this idea in the past here. A direct proof of a conditional is this scenario, P, therefore Q. That's the basis of a proof, right? 99% of your proofs are like this, right? If P happened, then Q happened. But this key thing, and this is probably the weirdest part to wrap your head around at first when you're dealing with proofs, in a direct proof, in all proofs, we're assuming the thing on the left of the conditional, which we're just using P as a placeholder, it's true. If P is not true, I don't care what Q is, right? Remember our example, if I win the lottery, I'll give you a dollar? If I didn't win the lottery, I don't care whether I give you a dollar or not. You don't care whether I give you a dollar or not. It's irrelevant. My proof is only if P occurred, then I care, okay? So that's your starting point. You have something, therefore something. Remember these things with the, the people in the class taking the test. If those things are true, therefore, we had that conclusion, okay? Then once you have your statement there, you will use rules of inference, and then your final step, step will prove that Q was true. All we know when we're starting with a proof is this, that we know we want to prove that that's true, and we assume that this occurred. Because if it didn't occur, I don't care, all right? Questions on that? Setting the stage here. So let's take, let's do a proof right now. We're going to prove that any odd number squared is also odd, right? So three times three is nine, right? That's odd. Three, the three squared is not, is odd. Now, how do I prove that for every single number, right? How many numbers are there? <coughs> infinite, there's an infinite number. There's no number of numbers. It just goes on forever. So how can you prove that it's true for every single number that could exist, right? This is where we get into, and I, I think... Uh, somebody was sitting over here asked this question. I don't remember who it was. Um, but it was asking about this universal um, generalization, how we can go from P of A to therefore universal P of X, right? Um, this, we'll see that in action right now, okay? So let's start with our definitions. An even number is defined as 2K where K is some constant, right? In other words, some number times 2 is a definition of an even number. You guys agree with that, right? If I say um, three times two, that's an even number, six. Anything doubled is an even number. Agreed? Okay. Therefore, an odd number, this is also a definition, is 2K plus one. I take any even number and I add one to it, obviously it's odd, right? So these are our definitions we're starting with. Okay. This is where I really need to be on the whiteboard right now. Okay. Oh, man, the urge is strong. Resist, man, resist. Okay, let P of X be the statement that X is odd. So I'm starting off again. Look at what we're trying to prove here. 
we'll prove that any odd number squared is also odd. All right, so I'm going to start off by saying, here's one proposition, here's another proposition, therefore, here's my P, therefore Q, right? Look at that closely. P of X is the statement that X is odd. Q of X is the statement that X squared is odd. So I'm saying if X is odd, therefore X squared is odd. Yeah? Okay. So my claim that um, 2K plus 1 is true, therefore 2K plus 1 squared must also be true. Do you understand my claim there? Because what's 2K plus 1? It's an odd number. So my claim is that, that, if, if, that if, if, if such number 2K plus 1 exists, therefore if I square that number, 2K plus 1 squared, that must also be odd. Okay? And that, I should probably reword that a little bit. That should say um, that therefore 2K plus 1 squared is odd must be true. In fact, let's edit that right now. <laughs> All right, let's try this again. Sorry. So our claim is that 2K plus 1 is odd. If that, that is true. Therefore, 2K plus 1 squared is odd must also be true. Agreed with my statement an hour later? Sorry about that. All right, questions about the claim. So if that's our claim, then let's take a look at what our proof would look like. We're going to take our odd number, 2K plus 1, and we're just going to algebraically square it, right? 2K plus 1 times 2K plus 1. That's our that's basic algebra, right? So what's that going to end up being? You guys remember FOIL, right? 4K squared plus 4K plus 1, yeah, okay? So 4K squared plus 2K plus 2K, which again becomes 4K. Everybody get my math? We, that's all basic algebra there, okay? Which becomes 4K squared plus 4K plus 1. Now, remember what we're trying to accomplish here, guys. Um, what we're trying to do is we're looking for... Oh, my screen's freaking out. We're looking for something that is going to calculate and in the end look something like that. Remember, we're trying to mathematically manipulate this to look a certain way. And we'll either be able to do it or we won't be able to. Okay? So I need to somehow mathematically manipulate this to look something like that. Make sense? So what can I do to do that? Think about what, what our formula looks like right now. We have everything's plus signs, right? Addition. So when that's true, what's that logical equivalence rule, which is also true in algebra? With parentheses? Yeah, we can put parentheses anywhere we want, right? So let's start there. And hopefully my slide will continue. All right, so let's take this equation down here and let's put parentheses wherever we want. And now, we're starting to sort of get there, right? I've got something plus one. Remember, I'm trying to make it look like a 2K plus one, right? So I've got something plus one. What could I do that would get us closer just by looking at that? I could factor out a two, right? I could factor out a two. So if I factor out a two, I get two times 2K plus K, or 2K squared plus K plus one. Believe it or not, that's it. That is the proof, okay? Now, it may not be obvious right away, but that is the form of 2 times some constant plus 1. Do you see that? Okay, what's the some constant in this case? It's not k, it's something else. What is it? 2k squared plus k. That's, that could, we could call that, uh, I think I used x in my slide here. Okay, so we start here. That's what we've come to as a conclusion. Well, that, let's just say that the stuff in parentheses here, We'll just call it C, right? You can give that a variable name, right? That's fine. We'll call it, or call it X, I should say. So this evaluates to X. So if that's true, then what do we have? We have this formula 2 times 2K squared plus K plus 1 is the same thing as 2X plus 1. Well, what is 2X plus 1? Where X is some constant. That's the definition of an odd number, isn't it? K is irrelevant. It doesn't have to be a K. It's just any, any placeholder. So we've proven, just mathematically through algebra, that if I square an odd number, it, the answer will also be an odd number. You dig it? Now, what if I did put k here? Is that right, wrong, and different? Does it matter? I have one vote for doesn't matter? For the whole thing or just for x? 
For the X, yeah, sorry. All right, somebody else says it doesn't matter. Anybody want to counter that? It does matter? It does matter? Okay, you're like, just I'll randomly say it does matter? Okay. <laughs> the truth is it does matter. Yeah. Why does it matter? Because K is a specific number. I don't know what that number is, but it is a specific number, right? We're claiming that we've got some number K. When I double it, then that's an even number. Or when I double it and add one, that's an odd number. K is a specific number. It's a constant, right? It's some specific number. Well, X is a different number, right? If I add whatever K is squared times 2 plus whatever K is, that will not be K. You can see that mathematically. We will not evaluate to K, right? It'll value to some other number. I don't know what that number is either. I'm just going to call it X. Okay, make sense? So when you do a proof, you have to be careful of that. Okay? All right. Because if I were to call this K, what I've proven is that some odd number squared, the result is the same odd number I started with. You guys follow that? Okay, because remember our original claim, I can go back a couple slides here. One more. My original claim was that if I square 2K plus 1, I'll get an odd number. Well, if ultimately when all is said and done, I said 2K plus 1 times 2K plus 1 equals 2K plus 1, that claim is that 2K plus 1 squared is equal to itself, its original number. Make sense? Which is would be false. Okay, good. All right, enough being a dead horse on that. Let's get back to where we were. I need to change that transition. That's annoying. All right, um, and there, we, I just had the last little line there. The definition of an odd number, again, is 2x plus 1, where x is some constant, okay? All right, so we need to continue on, though, with our proof, with our statement. So since the definition of an odd number is blah, 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 thus any odd number squared is odd. This is the scenario where we had the just the one instance, some number k. I don't know what that number is, but it proved to hold true. But because of the way we did our math, since it's true for that 1k that could have been any number, then it's true for all numbers. Make sense? That's where you get that uh, universal generalization. Follow that? Questions about that? We're getting a few blank stares. We doing okay? Yeah? All right. Okay. So, direct proof. Um, we're going to do another one, example number two. We're going to prove, look at the second part there, that the sum of two rational numbers is rational. What's a rational number? Don't look at the definition, just in regular terms. What is it? Yeah, it's something that can be written as a ratio, right? Some number over another number. There's one of the qualification, which you can see in our definition there, that um, the, the denominator cannot be zero, right? Uh, and I apologize for using the not symbol there. That's a programming thing, not a discrete <laughs> math thing. Sorry about that. So don't get that confused, right? So the real number R is rational if there exists integers P and Q, with Q not being zero such that R, that's the rational number, is equal to P divided by Q. Make sense? That's a mathematical definition of a rational number. A real number that is not rational is called irrational. Those are our definitions. So I want to prove that the sum of two rational numbers is also rational. If I add up some fraction to another fraction, basically, then it will be another fraction. It could be represented as a fraction, okay? And by the way, is, is three a rational number? Sure, it can be represented as a ratio of 3 over 1, right? Okay, um, so, and again, if we happen to be using quantifiers, which we could in our proof here, then we're claiming that for all real numbers, uh, where R, you know, all real numbers, for every real number R and every real number S, if R and S are rational, then we add them together, then that's going to be rational too. That's what we're trying to prove. All right, let's take a look at this. So let's start off, let R be the rational number P over Q, where Q is not equal to 0. Let S be the rational number where T over U is where U is not zero. We've defined our two rational numbers. Agreed? Okay. So what am I claiming? I'm claiming that R plus S is also rational. Okay? So in other words, I'm claiming that P over Q plus T over U is rational. Agreed? Okay, simple enough. So here's my proof. Um, well, this is the starting of my proof, right? Mathematically, P over Q plus T over U is that. Agreed? That's just basic algebra, right? Uh, if you're not familiar with that, you have to go back and look at your Algebra 2 books, okay? But that's, that's mathematically correct. 
Now, what can we observe just by that alone? What do we know about that final equation? I mean, we've basically answered it already. What's the rule of being a rational number? It's a ratio. So we have the ratio part, good. What's the other rule? That the denominator is not zero. Is our denominator not zero? And if so, how do we know? If not, how do we know? So since Q and U are both non-zero values, to multiply them together will also be a non-zero value, right? So we have some number, whatever QU plus QT is, or PU plus QT, whatever that is, divided by some non-zero number. That's a rational number. I never noticed until right now you have PU, like PU, and QT, like, oh, you're a cutie. That's hilarious right there. Yeah. Um, that is a bullet. But the way that the dash, but you know what I mean, the way the dash looks. Yeah, you that's, know it as a bullet, yeah. Like a yeah, I, there's another slide where I saw that it was making more of a problem, so I changed them to little circles or something, little squares. But yeah, those are bullets. That's a good observation, though. Yeah, that's not a negation symbol. And actually, the negative symbol would not look like that, right? It would be a little line with a, like a sideways seven, right? So that, a negative, that's technically no, not. Right, you're going P over Q plus T over U. Oh, like minus? Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, good, good point. But yeah, that is just a bullet point, but good catch. All right, so if this is all holding true, then we, let's look at how we would make our final conclusion here. Since Q and U are both non-zero, therefore X times Q is, all, or Q is uh, not zero. Thus, we have some number divided by some other number where that some number is not equal to zero, right? And so that, that's how you would write your proof up. That's the sort of a formal way. We wrote up our, our definitions, our claims, our proof. We walked through it mathematically, and we've come to the conclusion. Thus, r plus s is rational. Therefore, the sum of two rational numbers is rational. And again, I'll get you in two seconds. And again, we have taken this thing where we generically just proved it for some r. Who knows what r's value is? Who knows what s's value is? But because r and s could literally have been any value that's in the domain, Therefore, it's true for all values in the domain. Yeah? So why do you have to do a proof for a rational number plus a rational number, but not one for the non-zero times non-zero equals non-zero? Because that's a mathematical axiom. If you multiply, the only way to get zero in a multiplication is if you multiply by zero, right? Yeah. Does that make sense? I mean, there's no other way to get zero as a, as a product, right, as a multiplication product, um, unless you've multiplied by zero somewhere. So... Because we just know as a mathematical axiom that, that as long as you're not multiplying by zero, your result will be a non-zero value. So could I claim like the a rational number plus a rational number is a rational, could I claim that's an axiom? Well, no, again, that's what we were saying earlier. You can't just make up axioms, right? So what, what makes the non-zero one an axiom with the rational number? Because it's, again, an axiom is just one of those things that you don't need to prove. It's just obvious, right? Well, I think rational number plus it may be. It may be obvious. Um, but this is just a way to prove that it, it does exist. And maybe this is, this may be an actual known axiom, and we just walk through how to prove it. Okay. But, but again, if you're, something like not getting a zero result with non-zero numbers, that is a no-brainer, like from the time you're like learning multiplication as a little kid, right? That's pretty much a no-brainer. Whereas when you're first learning math, saying that rational plus rational that may not be as, as much of a no-brainer, right? That makes sense? So the, the basically, the, to, in my mind, and this is a silly way to put it, but an axiom is a no-brainer, right? Now, the level of no-brainer, like some people, what's a no-brainer for you may not be for me, right? So you might be able to look at things and go, well, yeah, duh, that's obviously true. Um, and a lot of the proofs we've looked at, right, like the, the very first proof we did uh, with the lions and the coffee, they, you kind of look at it and go, yeah, obviously, right? but we still want to walk through the idea of how a proof works. And so we're starting with basic, simple examples first. We'll get into more complex ones a little bit later. Okay, other questions? Yeah, probably a less important, and that's, that's, that's subjective, but yeah, yeah. And I, a second ago, I misheard you. I thought you said, can I claim that a rational plus a rational is irrational? I thought that's what you said, which is why I said, no, you can't make up an axiom. Right, I, I, I'm realizing now you weren't asking that. You're asking if I can make the axiom that they are rational. So I, I misheard that.
But either way, it's that the mathematical axioms are just defined already. We just have them. They already exist. So, questions? <laughs> I've been remembering to put those slides in so that I don't forget to make sure you guys are doing okay. We feeling all right about all that? Okay, let's look at another proof. How are we doing on time? Okay. Um, so, vacuous and trivial proofs. I told you about these the other day, and we already know this. Uh, we just didn't know the terms for them. But um, a vacuous proof, if we are trying to prove P therefore Q, which is basically what all proofs are for the most part, if P happened, then therefore Q happened. Well, if P is false, then we already know that P therefore Q is true. Right? We learned that on day one. So there's your proof. P was false. It, the, true, the, the proof is vacuously true. Well, it's vacuous because think of that word vacuous. What's the root of that? Same root that gives us the word vacuum, sort of empty, right? Um, it's an empty proof. It's, it's meaningless because the whole point of a proof is if P occurred, then did Q occur? Well, P didn't even occur. Since P didn't occur, then the whole thing's still true. Right? Make sense? And so it's just a vacuous proof that's sort of not very, very meaningful. Um, the second one is a trivial proof, which is where Q is true. Well, if Q is true, then again, P's value doesn't matter. Right? Because the whole point of a proof is P occurred, therefore Q must occur. Follow? So when Q already occurs, well, I didn't prove that it will only occur with P, but I've just proven that the whole thing is true because Q is true, so it's just a trivial proof, right? It's not the, the full substantial proof where we have P and we want to see if, if Q exists. Dig it? Okay. Looks like an example here. So we want to show that the proposition P of 0 is true, where P of N is that if N is greater than 1, therefore N squared is greater than N. The domain is all integers. So is this true or false? So I'm hearing people say it's true because you plug 0 in for the n, right, which is what we're claiming. And then now our equation looks like if 0 is greater than 1, therefore n squared is greater than n. Well, 0 is not greater than 1. So p didn't occur. If p didn't occur, it's a what kind of proof? Vacuous proof, right? So. We're looking, our P therefore Q is N greater than 1, therefore N squared greater than 2. That's our P therefore Q. And because P is false, then P therefore Q is vacuously true, right? All right. So let's look at another one. Trivial or vacuously true or true some other way or false, whatever. P of N, if A and B are positive integers, this is what P of N stands for, then uh, with A being greater than or equal to B, therefore A to the nth power is greater than or equal to b to the nth power. Domain is all non-negative integers. Show that p of 0 is true. Yeah. So 1 equals 1. Yeah, very good. So we don't know the values of a and b. We have no idea what they are. All we know is n, which is 0 at the moment, right? So our claim is that p, therefore, q, again, that's your proof, is the same thing as saying... Uh, a is greater than, or if A is greater than or equal to B, therefore, A to the N will be greater than or equal to B to the N. That's our claim. We plug in. Um, it, we ask the question, is P true, right? Well, is A greater than or equal to B? Is it true? True. Yeah. It's trivial. Is, so, but my question, is A greater than or equal to B? That's my question. We don't know. That's an unknown thing. We do not know because we don't know what A and B are. Right, that's unknown. So then let's look at the next part of it. Is Q true? In other words, is A to the N greater than or equal to B to the N? And you came up with the answer just a second ago, Chad, and you said? Yeah, so this is actually, yes, it is true. And the way we know that is because A to the N is the same thing as A to the 0. A to the 0, anything to the 0 is always 1. Therefore, B to the N is the same thing. And therefore, 1 is greater than or equal to 1 is true. Therefore, it is trivially true. Q was true, but we didn't know about P. P might have been true, but Q was true. Okay. Got it? Questions? <laughs> so we've looked at a direct proof. We looked at a couple of them, right? Where you just mathematically try to work your way through it. We looked at um, dealing with odd numbers being squared. We looked at um, rational numbers being added together. And then we looked at a couple vacuous and trivial proofs, right? You feel okay about that?